Well, thanks, Mark, for that um, daunting introduction. But really, honestly, it's a great pleasure to be here tonight to tell you about some of the exciting work that my colleagues and I are doing um, in Antarctic science. And so I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey. Um, but what I want to do first is actually set a little bit of the scene, because this is about more than Antarctica. And in fact, to illustrate it, I want to quote uh, uh, one of my favourite quotations from an American author called Barry Lopez. Barry described Antarctica as a place from which to take the measure of the planet. And that's really what we're talking about here. That's what I want to talk about tonight. Our planet is actually situated in the void. It's our, our spaceship uh, in the universe. And we see when we look at it from afar, just in my lifetime, coming a little blase about images like this, and then you stop and realise what we're looking at. The defining feature of the Earth when we look at it, at least in our solar system, is that blue. And as we step back, we can even step back one and a half billion kilometres to Saturn. Just if you look, you can make out the pinprick of blue light, the pale blue dot that is the Earth. In fact, that expression, the pale blue dot, dates from a little bit before this image. If we go to the next one from the 1970s, the Voyager spacecraft, the first man-made spacecraft to really travel out through the solar system. This is from six billion kilometres away. And what do we see? We see, if we look, the pale blue dot that is our home. Now that blue tells us something really important. The blue is our atmosphere, that thin layer that actually surrounds the Earth and makes all of life possible. That layer that actually controls our climate. If it wasn't for the greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, the temperature of the planet would be about 33 degrees colder. And as I'll show you a little bit tonight, as those greenhouse gases change over time, so does the climate of the planet. And so that's really what we're looking at when we want to actually understand Antarctica and climate. In fact, we can see just in the human measurements of the last, here we go, 30, 40 years. This is from the Cape Grim station in northwest Tasmania. If I go for the longest instrumental record, I can use the Mauna Loa Hawaii record. But what we see over these recent decades is the inexorable rise of CO2 in the atmosphere. That's us. That's industrialisation. That's our use of fossil fuels. Taking carbon that's been buried in the earth for billions of years and putting it back into the atmosphere. And that has consequences. And so if we look at that, we realise that humans are actually a, a planetary force. We are living, as it's been said, in the Anthropocene, the human era. And so if we're going to understand what's happening now and into the future, we really need to look back. And in fact, I like the Confucius quote, to study the past if you would divine the future. And so that really is what motivates the research that I do with my colleagues in Antarctica. So I want to take you to Antarctica now. If you listen, perhaps, no, we don't have the speakers, you could hear the, the roar of the wind across the Antarctic plateau. It's a forbidding, hostile and actually beguiling place in which to work. Amazing and it would have looked like this for millions of years on the high Antarctic plateau. Those snowflakes blowing across the plateau settle eventually and with the other snowflakes around them they actually start to get buried. As they get buried though, it's fascinating because what they carry with them are signatures, chemical signatures from volcanic eruptions on the other side of the planet. Large eruptions that actually deposit sulphur through the atmosphere. Other chemicals too, like sea salts that are blown in from the distant ocean, telling us about the winds and the patterns. Or perhaps it's soot, carbon that gets blown, gets transported to Antarctica from large fires in northern Australia or Africa. All of these large global events leave a signature in the ice. In fact, even high in the atmosphere, we see the dance between the sun's influence and cosmic rays, changes the bombarding of the atmosphere and produces 
at atomic signals that we get buried in the snow that tell us how active the sun was in the past. So we can learn a great deal by studying those snowflakes and the chemicals that get deposited. So year after year, century after century, these snowflakes get buried. And so what we find when we look at the snow is that we've got a record of environmental change in the past. And as they get buried, there's one last thing, one last important trace that actually gets captured. In between the snowflakes, the little pores of space, the little pockets of air actually get buried. And as we go deeper and deeper and the snow turns into ice, those pockets of air turn into bubbles. And so on the left hand side, we can see some ice that's taken just about where the bubbles are starting to be pinched off by the pressure of all the ice and snow above it. And so those bubbles get trapped and eventually at depth, you get what you see on the right hand side, ice that's actually filled with a myriad of bubbles. About 10% of the ice that's actually formed is actually air from the past. So we can actually capture those bubbles, crack them open and measure the very composition of the past atmosphere. And that's really the power of ice cores. And what we see, nature's very conveniently pro provided us here with a sample. If we slice through the ice, this is an ice shelf on the edge of the continent, we can see the layers of ice and snow as we go deeper and deeper. So you see the large fluffy layers of snow at the top becoming compressed as we go further and further down. That ice shelf we're looking at there is about 30 metres high. If we go into the centre of Antarctica, we can drill into ice that's three kilometres thick and go very far back in time. And to do that, we need equipment, we need to get out in the field. And what you see on the left hand side is a typical ice core drill um, developed by the scientific community over decades. We swap designs and we've actually refined the technology so that we can recover an ice core like the one you see on the left. On the right, you can see some of my colleagues actually working in a tent in Antarctica uh, for a short summer expedition. We go out for maybe six to eight weeks um, deep into Antarctica and in this case recover an ice core in a single season that might be a few hundred metres deep telling us about recent centuries or millennia. And so we build up a picture. Just like in Australia, you wouldn't try and understand climate with one record from Hobart or Darwin. In Antarctica, in the same way, we build up our picture of the climate from multiple ice cores. And so as we work in Antarctica, we actually need to live and actually sustain ourselves. Here we've got um, a camp. We had 500 kilometres inland from the coast at a height of about 10,000 feet. So it was cold, even in summer. And we were sleeping in tents like the ones you see there and actually working in a small field camp. You can see there laid out the living area and mess tent. You can see a tent where we do analysis and drilling. And of course, those sleeping tents that you saw in the previous slot, all powered by a small diesel generator or two. And so sustaining ourselves, we're, we realise exactly how alien we are in that landscape because we don't belong, it's trying to kill us. But it's exciting to work there. And in fact, I said it's trying to kill us, it really is quite a, a fight for survival. This is a drilling camp we're in um, and almost as soon as we turned up in fine blue skies and set our camp up, we had two weeks of constant blizzard which just about buried us. But nevertheless, we were able to do our work and recover an ice core. Just want to show you now what it's actually like drilling a core, give you a little bit of understanding of the process. Here we've got one of my colleagues actually carving out a slot in the ice so that we can set the drill up. Uh, here we've got a drill that's actually quite small and portable. We can fly that in a small aircraft and take it to wherever we need to go. The aircraft itself has got skis so we can land. And you can see the drill here gets lowered down into the ice on a cable, on a winch, deep into the ice sheet and actually drills for five or ten minutes, recovering a couple of metres of ice core. And then we actually lift the, wind the cable back in, pull the drill back up and eventually we can extract the ice.
you'll see actually there's a little wooden trap door incidentally on that, core, on that hole that we're drilling in. One of the most um, uh, difficult things or one of the most uh, awkward things that can happen when you're drilling is if somebody kicks a spanner or a hammer and it goes and bounces down the hole. That's the end of your field trip. So uh, we take some measures to make sure that doesn't happen. And so once the core's up, we actually pull the, um, the barrel of the drill out and when we can remove the ice and actually make some basic measurements. Uh, we pack the ice up in clean um, conditions and put it into insulated boxes so that we can then bring that back to Hobart so we careful, take careful measurements of the core. And you can see it's a fairly nice day outside there, but in fact in the tent we can continue to work in fairly hostile conditions. That process might take three or four weeks before we finish and fly back out. So Mark mentioned some of the things that ice cores tell us and in fact uh, we have found links between uh, the weather patterns that control Antarctic weather and Australian weather and we've used that to um, understand more about drought and rainfall in Australia, not just over the recent period where we've got meteorology uh, observing stations but going back hundreds, in fact thousands of years which is really important. But Mark also mentioned the major project we're doing to try and drill for the oldest ice in Antarctica and that's really where I want to focus tonight. If there's one result from the field of ice coring that's opened our eyes I suppose more than anything, it's the result about how things have changed in the long term. And so here we see a record of carbon dioxide now from the longest and oldest ice core so far recovered. It goes back 800,000 years and in that record you can see the rising and falling of CO2 that happens with the ice ages that come and go. Ice ages are cold periods where we get large ice sheets that cover northern North America and northern Europe, up to two or three kilometres of ice over those northern continents. The temperature of the earth as a whole is probably only four or five degrees colder in an ice age, but it's enough to actually make this dramatic sort of change. And so as we look back, we see this pulsing of the ice ages in the carbon dioxide. In cold periods, the CO2 is about 180 parts per million. In warm periods, it's around about 280 parts per million. If you actually recall the graph I showed you at the start from Cape Grimm, you will have realised that the numbers now are much larger. And in fact, on the right-hand side, we see the current level of CO2 is at 411 parts per million way, way higher than anything we've seen in that 800,000 years. Very potent evidence that we are a planetary force. And so you can see that CO2 rise also has occurred instantaneously in terms of the geological history of the planet, much faster than any of the changes that we've seen beforehand. And that's important because in fact, if we look back in time to deep time, what we see is that the uh, CO2 changes to even higher levels than we've got today have been associated with dramatic events on the planet, with mass extinctions and with big changes. That's the kind of thing that would be kind of nice to avoid in our future. Ice cores tell us more if we look now at the other part of evidence that we see from the same ice core we can see the temperature over that 800,000 years. And the temperature, not surprisingly, shows the same ice age cycles from warm to cold. About every 100,000 years, give or take, we end up with a warm period and then we fall back into an ice age. And that pattern repeats over the 800,000 years. You'll also notice that that looks a heck of a lot like the CO2 graph we just showed. And in fact, they are remarkably alike. In fact, we can overlay the two. And what you see is that CO2 on this planet and temperature are intricately linked. They dance together, one feeding the other as we go through the ice age cycles. But 800,000 years is kind of not the end of history, it's just the end of ice cores. It would be really interesting to know what happens before that 800,000 years. And so here we've got the same two curves I showed you with the CO2 on the top, the temperature in the middle, 
But now I've introduced a third curve which comes from ocean sediment records. And so in those ocean sediment records, we see the same signature of the ice ages coming and going. It's a sort of temperature signal, but it's a bit more complicated. I won't go into that at the moment. And in fact, the thing about ocean sediment cores is we can take that record back millions of years. What we see, though, is really frustrating for an ice core scientist because it's just when our 800,000 years stops that the ice age cycles start to look different. They're shorter, they're faster, and in fact, the cold portions aren't even as cold as they are in the last 800,000 years. What's going on? What's changed? A million years ago sounds like a long time, but in terms of the Earth's geology, it's really pretty much the same planet we have today. And this is a really big conundrum and problem for ice core science, or for paleoclimate science, as we call it generally, because we don't know what caused that change in the ice ages. We see faster cycles, we see slightly less amplitude to those. What was the CO2 doing in this period? Was the CO2 pulsing at the same faster rate? Was it higher or lower than it was through most of the 800,000 years? We know that we're heading into an era now because of our influence that's going to be different. It'd be really nice to understand why something changed in the past. So we want to drill for really old ice, but how do we do that? This satellite image, or it's composed of satellite information, shows the flowing of the ice off Antarctica. And you can see the ice forms a streaming sort of flow as it flows towards the edge of the continent. If a snowflake a million years ago lands anywhere here in this blue area, it's going to have whizzed off the continent over the last million years and it's going to be gone. But high in the centre, you can see, just as it's faded out there, almost well, you can imagine there's watersheds, parts of the continent where the ice doesn't quite know whether it's going to flow to this ocean or that ocean. And the motion is very slow. Ice in those areas has been sitting there for long enough that it probably has ice actually well over one and a half million years. And that's where we want to go to drill. To find that's kind of tricky, we've been working with international colleagues. There's about 24 nations that are um, involved in ice coring, and it's all pretty highly collaborative, which is good because most of what we do is too large and too expensive for any one country to do completely alone. So we've been flying this aircraft now for many seasons, and you can see hanging under the left-hand wing, there's one on the other side, is a radar antenna. And so we can fly that aircraft across the ice, send radar signals into the ice and measure how thick it is and actually even see layers in the ice that tell us how old it is. And in fact, that's what we're seeing on the left. This is now a slice through the ice where the aircraft flew over. On the bottom, you can see the dark hills at the bedrock at the bottom of the ice sheet, about three kilometres below the surface. And what you can also see is some coloured layers. That's just because we put some traces across. But they capture horizons in the ice that we can actually date and trace back to that 800,000-year-old ice core. So we get a bit of a picture of where it might be good to go and do better. We, we want to beat that 800,000 years. And so we've done that work. And in fact, like other nations, we think we've picked a really good spot to go drilling down in the bottom Oh, on the right hand side we can see a, a red circle, it's a place called Dome C, it's actually only about 30 kilometres away from where the 800 kilometre, 800,000 year ice core was drilled. So they were a little bit lucky if they'd just gone 30 kilometres away they probably would have got older ice. Um, there's a European drilling effort that's setting up to drill there, um, they like us think that's probably the best spot and we're getting set to drill quite soon. But there's other places. Over on the other side, Japan's getting set to drill at a place called Dome F, and China has been drilling for some years, slowly, at a very inhospitable place called Dome A, which is actually the highest point in Antarctica. Turns out that high and very thick ice isn't necessarily the best thing, because where the ice is thickest, it's also getting heat from the earth coming up that can melt it. And in fact, there are hundreds of lakes underneath the Antarctic ice sheet, so you don't want to drill where there's melting at the bottom. So we're set, getting set now to actually start drilling. 
This is a, a tractor train expedition I was on a few years back. It's a French uh, logistics train. And we, as Mark said, drove for about 13 days at 10 kilometres an hour to get to the drilling site in those tractors. It was kind of fun and hypnotic and mesmerising and a little harsh too at times. But in order to get to Dome C and set up and do our drilling, this is the kind of infrastructure we need. And so Australia's actually kitting up. The Australian Antarctic program hasn't had that capacity to actually move over snow for some years, not great distances. So we're assembling a fleet of five tractors, three groomers to actually prepare the road for the tractors, and a whole caravan trail of vans and fuel sleds to actually take us there. And you can see the first of the Australian tractors already in Antarctica there, complete with a bit of Ken Doan livery on the front of it uh, for a bit of a signature there. So we're getting set. Uh, in fact, this season, all going well and COVID allowing, we hope to get most of the rest of our kit, apart from that tractor, into Antarctica so we can start getting the traverse up and running. And it's not going to be like those summer camps I showed you. This is going to be a place we're going to be occupied for the next four to five years, drilling every summer. So we, this is actually the 800,000 year uh, drilling camp, but we're going to have tents that are much more significant infrastructure. A drill here you see that's much, much larger than that drill that we were operating in the field. In fact, on the right hand side um, is the drill that we're building at the Antarctic Division to do this. When it's completed, it'll be about 10 metres long uh, and weigh well over a tonne. So it's quite an exercise in using that drill. Some of the parts you can see here that we're fabricating uh, in, an, in the Antarctic Division, uh, precision machining, and it's really exciting to actually take the best designs internationally and adapt those and feed that back out to the community. So that brings us to the end. I mean, it, it's the end and the beginning. We're looking forward to getting going, uh, perhaps with a, a little bit of drilling this season. Uh, I want to sort of loop back, though. Um, this is an exciting science puzzle we've been solving. And it's a great challenge to get into the field, but I don't want to lose sight of the reason why. The reason, if I saw the tallest anything, it's that we are indeed a planetary force, as I said tonight. That means we have the power, in a sense, to change our future for good or for bad. Now, we hear a lot of bad news about what's happening in the climate space at the moment about our impact. But if we learn enough about the past and apply that to 